Yeah, one more tell up. Robert Torres, come on in. So great. So one thing that we didn't add to the agenda, but I want to make sure that you know, Vicki's here obviously all day. You may have questions about the data. There are issues that may have come up in your head. Jot down a note. You know, she'll be part of the conversation in an ongoing way. If you have a question or a comment or an interpretation that you'd like to share, of course. So it is a distinct pleasure, and to quote <laughs> Vicki, a privilege to invite Amy Jordan to join us. Um, all of you have in your places uh, bio sketches. I don't want to take up too much time with the introductions, but one thing that I do want to call to your attention is a special honor that Amy, who's the Associate Director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, has just received. She is the, I hope I get this right, Amy, the President-Elect Select <laughs> what? Um, of the International Communications Association. And you know she's also somebody who's been recognized for outstanding scholarship and contributions in the field of um, children and adolescent media health promotion and so on. And Amy's going to take you through um, a little bit of an overview of the interactive forum that is starting right now. Amy. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I, I also want to um, recognize Michael and Vicki for just doing an amazing job in bringing together this group of people that we have here. I mean, we're filled, every seat appears to be filled, but even more impressive is the diversity of the community that they've managed to bring together. So congratulations on, on such an excellent forum for discussion. I also want to say that you know, the John Gantz Community Center has been really at the cutting edge of recognizing what we need to be talking about. So they recognize the need for um, studying the learning that occurs in informal settings, most specifically in the home. They recognize the importance of development in the earliest years, something I know that we've been talking about, but they've really been doing a lot of high quality, excellent research into. They recognize the need for engaged parenting around media, and that includes both talking about the concerns we have, but also highlighting the opportunities for um, allowing parents and children to be interacting more around, around media, especially digital media. And they have led research in cutting edge research into um, really understanding the many demographic contours of American families today. And I'm so pleased to see that you have a longitudinal study plan where we can actually track children as they go through these years with a media environment that's really changing. So congratulations on that. It's not fully funded yet. <laughs> as I said, there are always the opportunities. <laughs> Um, today, what we'll be doing is um, having, as I think both Vicki and Michael have pointed out, an interactive discussion. And we're lucky to have these discussions kicked off by individuals who are up to their elbows in these issues. So the format will be, uh, I'll call up each uh, speaker, um, I think we call them respondents, is that what you call them? I call them provocateurs. Provocateurs. <laughs> We'll call up each provocateur. He or she will speak for five to seven minutes. I understand there is someone here nearby, here's our person, uh, who will be bringing the, um, the, the presentation to a close if it goes overly long. And the reason for that isn't because we don't want to hear from our provocateurs, but because we want to hear from you. So as, as each speaker ends, we will um, open it up for a 10 or 15 minute conversation close it up and go on to our next speaker. Vicki's research highlights the importance of three topic areas, at least for, for the session that I'm moderating this morning. So the first has to do with implications, um, implications for mobile. So we'll start with a conversation about that. Then we'll talk about implications for content. And we'll close our morning discussion with a, dis with a conversation about implications for parents. Okay. So our first provocateur is Deborah Sanchez. 
One of the issues that this study raises is that the proportion of, of mobile time that is perceived as educational is lower than the proportion of um, television time that's perceived as educational. And, and parents whose children are using mobile content are less likely to say that their children have learned a lot. So I think this is one of the issues that um, our panel will be discussing. And here to kick off our discussion about mobile media is Deborah Sanchez. She's CA Deborah. Let me tell you a little about her. Deborah is Senior Vice President for Education and Children's Content at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. At CPB, they've devoted a great deal of time to and thought to um, maximizing the impact of, of educational content across platforms from television to digital media. So we look forward to hearing what Deborah has to say today. Deb? So I'll have to tell my husband that I was officially called the provocateur in the large group. He likes to say that I, I do that at home sometimes. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And um, I, as I, when I talked to Vicki in preparation for this conversation, I told her that I read the report three times. Um, I first read it as a parent of two small children. So I have a son who's seven and a daughter who's 10. Just curious, by show of hands, how many people in the room have children in this specific age group? So a fair amount. And, and how many people, well, we, I came from DC. We were just home for the most <laughs> ungodly amount of snow days. <laughs> um, but experiencing my kids' use in real time of the many media platforms that we have in our home. And I wrote a blog post um, that I shared just about how overwhelming it is as a parent and, and really um, the support that's needed for parents in this space. But I, and I also read the report, so I took my parent hat off, and then I read the report as a, a media professional. And I wanted to just quickly clarify. So CPB and PBS, we work very closely together to really provide an, uh, an outstanding service to um, our nation's children and families. We work with a number of partners in the room, WGBH, Sesame Workshop, WNET, calling all of our partners out. Um, but we really, really collaborate quite closely to, to really determine what's the best service. And that's really an important word. It's about service to kids and to families. So at PBS, it's about curating content, distributing content, thinking about content. Um, that's going out to families. CPB is uh, responsible for managing the federal funding that we receive annually from Congress. So we really think about how best those precious, precious federal dollars are distributed in a way that helps build a greater service for kids and families. So I just wanted to clarify that because some of people are like, gosh, I just love all things considered. And I'm like, me too. I don't work there, but um, <laughs> I think we work with them. But just to clarify kind of the unique roles that we all play and, and do together. We also manage um, PDS and CPB, uh, a grant um, that we receive from the Department of Education. It's called Ready to Learn. There are a number of folks in this room that work with us on that project. Shelley Kazin from EDC, Kevin Clark's on our advisory committee. So we, we manage this grant, and in this year, this year, the past five years, four years so far, um, we've been looking specifically at transmedia and kind of the experience, not on distinct platforms, but really the, the integrated approach of delivering content in a way that really meets kids where they are. So media professional hat, I read the report. Then I tried to meld both of them together. And then I laid down for a little while. <laughs> um, but, but really, I think you know, a few big takeaways, and some of the data, clearly not surprised. Um, again, living through this in my own home and watching my, my daughter, who's 10, kind of age out of educational content, um, where she's noticing content and marking it on our calendar and I'm like what is that show and um, she's like it's a great show and I'm like it's junk so this is this is the house that, that we live in but anyway um, and then watching my son who just turned seven kind of begin to transition and who's really being drawn by my daughter's interests and following her lead in this media space and 
me feeling sometimes like my kids are holding this thing in the palm of their hand and they're kind of looking at it and kind of looking at me and I'm like, what's in there? And they're like, well, we're playing with this thing. And I'm like, well, what's in that thing? And this is what I think of as a mobile device. It's something in the palm of their hand that I don't always know what it is or I'm not necessarily part of. And I really think, and you know, thinking about implications for mobile, um, I think the pass back phenomenon has created kind of this environment where parents automatically opted themselves out of the mobile, mobile experience with their kids. Because you handed your phone back to your kids, and your kids interacted with the game. The phone came back to you, and the screen was your original home screen. And you'd look at it, and you'd say, gosh, what did they learn? What, what did they gain from that experience? I know what apps were on there, but they're really kind of understanding what they gained. So, in our ready to learn work, I know I have one minute, I'm gonna try very hard <laughs> to meet that. But in our ready to learn work, we really tried to explore building this um, kind of optimal loop where we can really look at tracking kids on these devices. It sounds kind of um, NSA type, but it's not, it's not that way. But it's really looking at kind of where their learning experiences were, what did they gain from the experience that they just um, that they just interacted with on that mobile device or online, um, and potentially making recommendations to parents about what they can do to help. That's a big deal, right? So it's a big deal to have that communication loop back to parents so that they know that there's something that's happening that's of value. My kid is experiencing this great educational content, but I also like to know what they're doing with it, how they're working with it, and what else they need and how I could support them. So that's something that we're working with, right, ready to learn. Um, I also think about the, the, the data about TV, and we like to think TV's still king, clearly. The data shows TV's still king. Um, but I think there's an opportunity for us to figure out how best, and, and we're really looking at this through ready to learn in a lot of ways and, and, and many other ways as well, but how do you use that television experience to really pivot and transition into the media of mobile media and online space. So quick example, um, working with Sesame Workshop, the electric company built um, at the end of their series, kind of this virtual world. Um, so live action, electric company series. The very end, there was a virtual world that was built in. And kids were invited through this virtual world to come with the characters and solve math problems. So you would watch the video on TV, you'd watch this interactive uh, two minute um, virtual experience, and then the kids would go and create their own avatar and work with the characters in the electric company. Now we didn't do a ton of uh, research on that, but we did see huge growth in web traffic as a result of that experience. So that's something I think that we are continuing to look at. I mean, how do you optimize that those experiences and how do you really leverage kind of the TV experience and figure out ways to kind of connect it more meaningfully to the online good and I think I'm out of time. I have more stuff to say but I will, I will pass it along to other people but thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you today. So we do have, um, we have microphones in the middle of every table. And I also know that we have, at most tables, people who are involved in the design and um, creation of the kinds of content that Deb just described. Um, I, I think I have in my notes here, we have someone from Duck Duck Moose, No Crust Interactive, Toka Boca. So there are folks who would like to weigh in specifically on um, issues related to the design and creation process. I'd love to hear from you. So Michael was pointing to someone. Well, this table has This table. Oh, all right. So I'm going to turn my attention to this table. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see it. Is it Michael? Sure. Yeah. 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 I can say who you are, please. Hello, I'm uh, Jens Peter Pedro. I'm a play designer at Toka Boca. Uh, we've done titles such as Hair Salon, Toka Band, and most recently Toka Lab, uh, which deals with elements uh, of the periodic table. Um, I think we see a drop-off at the end when, um, at 
starting at 6, 7, and, and 8 in children's interest in educational media. And I think a real villain is the schools. Um, <laughs> And uh, the prevalent teaching method that is at 99% of schools, which is uh, coercive learning, meaning I talk to you and you listen whether you want to or not. Um, when someone talks to you like that about a subject, it becomes very boring very fast. So the secret, um, other than trying to stop coercive learning, which is very, very difficult to do, but um, I intend to give it a try in the next 10 to 20 years, but the secret to um, getting kids interested in, educational, in an educational subject is beating schools to it, right? Uh, we, uh, we did this uh, Elements app, um, and it, it's aimed at children five to six or seven. We couldn't have done it for older kids because school has already wrecked that subject um, later on. But kids are naturally interested in the Elements. If you tell them, these are the building stones that everything is built of, these 114 or 130 something, whatever they are, every kid is fascinated. You tell that to someone who's had to sit through it forcefully, and it's not so much fun anymore. So that's my tip to everyone who wants to do educational media, but try to beat schools to the subject. Are there others who would like to weigh in on this in particular? Yeah, I'm Carla Fisher from No Cross Interactive. And uh, so we do a lot of independent work as well as, as work for a number of folks who are here. And what I wanted to, to actually speak to is sort of that idea of joint media engagement. So one of the apps we did called Williamsburg, which nobody can ever find because it's four R's and it's about putting cats and mustaches. And, but it was specifically about joint media engagement, of getting parents and kids to play together and designing problems that you actually can't solve by yourself. And the thing that was really eye-opening for me was the amount of time I had to spend educating parents about what it means to engage that way. And so one of the things that's become really important to me in, in developing is actually just talking to parents and explaining how to use things. And I think there's some other folks who have started thinking about this, whether it's through like YouTube videos that Rainbow Loom largely became popular because of their ability to talk about how to do it on YouTube. And that there's lots of different ways of engaging parents into these conversations, and so that's one of the things that's become really important to me to think about. Uh, I see a hand all the way back there. There's no mic here at all. Hi, I'm Ruth Cohen from the American Museum of Natural History, but where we have a lot of um, out of school um, The but I'm talking as a parent because in uh, regards to the comment just before, um, what we are doing in our school is forming a parent-teacher technology committee because there is no technology plan in, in the public school movement. So, um, and the parents aren't educated, they don't know what apps to use, and, and um, not just in this particular community, but I think many, what we want to do is form hubs of parents who are in communities, in media communities, who have the knowledge, have the resources, and can bring them into the school conversation because the schools have enough to do. Um, like ruin education. Um, so, um, the, the communication, the modes of communication and information for parents can happen um, in a more grassroots way and in a more, I think, turnkey way where there's a then actual use in an ongoing kind of parent-teacher alliance. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting notion that we have conversations about school learning at schools and we have conversations with parents about learning particularly with media in the home, but these these conversations rarely overlap, overlap. so that's, that's an excellent, excellent thought. Thank you, hi. I'm Julia Pimsler from Little Pim, and we've been teaching kids foreign languages for the last five years through videos and educational apps, and what we're hearing from our parents is that they wanted to understand better what their kids were learning. And what we've been really focused on, and I wonder if other folks are working on this too, is just making more transparent what's actually happening to the child during the experience. So kids watch Little Pim typically on a tablet or on TV, and they're learning 360 words in French, Spanish, or another language. And the parents say, well, that's great, and we've heard them say a couple words, but what really are they learning? 
So we just created a progress tracking app, and that's something where the parent can be on their own device, and they've got flashcards and things to quiz their kids on what they just learned. Because we're seeing in the home, everybody's got their own device. And so how can the parents on their device have interactivity and transparency about what the kids are doing on their device? And that's a really interesting area, I think, for exploration, is how we can help make the educational piece more visible. Right, and I think that really follows up nicely on the point that Deb was making about you pass back your phone and you don't really have a good sense of what, what the experience is like for the child or whether they're actually taking anything away. And I think we do have someone, uh, Warren Buckleitner, is he here? Warren here? Ah, Warren, I'm going to put you on the spot because I know you've been doing some interesting work where you're actually watching children interacting with these apps and, and other uh, kind of mobile portable devices. I have a good recipe for apple strudel. Actually, I was thinking as I heard, as I listened to Jens and, and so on, I, I was actually a classroom teacher, so I spent 180 days with a bunch of little kids. And so there are some specific things that you can do as a developer to uh, build on what Carla was saying, uh, to make your app classroom friendly, like have a sound toggle on and off, button uh, immediately makes it a librarian like it more and just being intelligent and going the other way if you're making a product for it, it uh, for school or formal learning say there are some things like simultaneous translation or, or language options that you can toggle on the fly you can also if it's, it has any language or reading you can do all these scaffolding techniques uh, and so these are some very exciting things that we're just beginning to see more of, but if you build those features into your interactive product, you can make it a, a more educational and, and increase the likelihood that it'll be used in a purposeful educational way. I don't even know if that's what I was supposed yeah, to talk about. Yeah, more enough. Thank you very much. I know there's someone else um, who's done a lot of work looking at how children are interacting with these sorts of devices and characters. I'm pointing to you, and it is you, it is you. So I, was, I wanted to turn to Sandra Calvert, who's, who's one of the leading researchers in this area. Well, that's very kind of you. I, I think of myself as more of an educator than a developer, although we certainly have been doing those things. When I was hearing about this educational gap, I was actually thinking about when it drops off, it is the point when they start going to school. But I was thinking, is it content availability or is it uses of gratification and some kind of selective exposure? That once you start going to school, then you're spending a lot of time doing academic work. And so when you get home, you want to do something that's more entertaining versus continuing to do something more. Because the, the overall amount of drop is small when you consider how much time they're in formal schooling. <coughs> so, you know, my sense is that, gee, maybe we're not missing them entirely. And, Personally, I have this great passion about teachers, since I am one, uh, you know, and I would hate to see us displaced, but I would like to see us partner with teachers. I would really like to see, I see them as our ally, and if we don't have them on board, it's kind of like the teachers are really competing against media, and media is like looking at teachers and saying, you know, you're not doing your job, and it's like, we need each other to really do the best by our children, and so I hope we can, we can go there. Maybe in the next iteration of this conference, Michael, we can have a cohort of teachers come in and share their experiences with us. So I see, I see a hand in the back. Go wait for a microphone. Yes, I, can I just talk loudly? No, no, Michael's away. Hi, I'm Howard Husick. I'm on the CP Board of Directors. Um, I had a question about the study. I'm not, to whom, not sure to whom it should be addressed, but I'm interested in whether the drop-off uh, seen after age four uh, is uniform across uh, income and social class groups, mm -hmm. and how we think about findings such as, you know, uh, Latino parents not engaging or disproportionately not engaging, and more broadly how we think about how to guard against educational media media reinforcing social class difference rather than uh, ameliorating. Yeah, I think that's a question for our study author, Vicki Rideout, or maybe Michael Levine. The question of whether uh, the drop-off in educational media use is uniform across different um, races, ethnicities, uh, income groups. It, it, it is. The pattern is, is uniform. Of course, the level is different because the lower-income kids are using more media to begin with. 
Um, but the pattern of the drop off by age is uniform across different groups. Yeah. And I'll just add that yeah. it's a great question, and we need to take a deeper dive in this area. And some of the regional studies that I described earlier that are part of the foundation funded consortium called FAM will be taking a much closer look at ethnographically some of these um, cultural patterns of use. And uh, June Lee, who's here, as well as Lori Takauchi, who's director of research at the Kimmy Center, are collaborating with Stanford on a uh, deeper dive into the data that you didn't see today. So there was an oversample of nearly 700 Hispanic Latino families represented in the aggregate data that you saw today. We're taking a deeper dive inside there. So I think we'll have some new insights as well. Yes. I, I just have a very quick comment. Stand up and introduce oh, yourself. My name is Evie Zuckerman, and uh, I work at the MIT Media Lab and School of Architecture. I just have a very quick comment that has to do with this sense that Deborah gave us that if you have something on a mobile device, it all gets miniaturized, it gets very private, and it becomes very difficult to share or to evaluate what's going on. So this is a $2.50 trick that is actually helpful, I think, is instead of tracking what everybody is doing and then pass it through the filter of some researcher or other entities that decide whether it's good or not, I call it project it out and magnify it. Because in a way, if you even use very simple projectors and in a family, you take whatever is on the screen People are intelligent. They will relate to it in the same way that they can actually with television, except that it will be interactive. So that's one of the sort of $2.50 tricks that probably goes a long way, even if it feels technocentric, because people will know how to, how to use those materials. I think we have time for one more comment, but I do, if I don't get to you, I'll, um, bring you into the conversation as we move through the rest of the panel this morning. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Taylor from Microsoft. And I just want to make a, just a thought-provoking uh, post-it note out there. Uh, as a grandmother, I didn't have the trauma that some of my colleagues and some of you in the room apparently had this week with the snow days, so I, I don't have to deal with that directly. But I found myself thinking a lot about learning at home as a new kind of snow day opportunity and how we can transform. And we know that we're in climate change. We see that increasingly kids are at home for one, you know, for these climate experiences. And so I'm wondering what the implications of this study might be for how you could partner with schools and teachers to turn snow days into yes. learning at home day. <laughs> oh, seriously, with um, the use of all of these tools and devices. And I haven't seen or heard anybody thinking about that, and I just want to put that out there. That is an inspired idea. <laughs> and um, on that note, we'll, we'll move to our next provocateur. Um, this is David Kleeman. So the survey references a trend, and we, we talked about it a little bit in the previous discussion, that we're seeing that children's um, choice of and interaction with educational media drops off, it feels like, sort of precipitously after the preschool years. Um, and I think this is something that needs to be explored more fully, and we have just the person here to do that sort of thing. Dana Kleeman is Senior Vice President for Insights Programs and a Play Evangelist that term, at Play Collective. So David, you've devoted decades of your career to um, improving the quality of educational content for children, both here in the U.S. and abroad. So thank you for joining this discussion. Thank you. Good morning. If you don't mind, I'm going to be on a script because I want to stay on time and on target. I have a lot to say on this. It's a topic I've gotten in trouble with before, and I hope to be provocative. <laughs> I've, uh, I'm going to talk a lot today about TV, which is still the leading medium for kids, but the strategy and policy implications, I think, work across platforms. Because, in my mind, the educational value of media has as much to do with the child's needs, interests, and abilities as it does with the attributes of the program, game, app, or website. I've got two central points. First, 
Maybe kids stop consuming educational media because what we offer isn't relevant or real to them. And before we pursue the report recommendation to create more content in curriculum areas that parents grade as weak, we need to answer why what we have now isn't working for them. Second, maybe older kids, or many older kids, are engaged with educational media, just not as defined by the research. Pursuit of media in the interest of a passion or curiosity, resources like YouTube and Google, supplants consumption of packaged media that's designed to teach something. Interestingly, when the survey asked parents about their own educational media use, the examples given were of self-directed, connected learning, looking up a recipe, getting health information, answering questions. In some cases, kids feel they learn from media even when it has no educative intent. A German research institute that's affiliated with the International Children's TV Festival that I'll talk about in just a moment, asked seven to 10 year olds around the world which programs they learn from. Over 50% of the American boys talked about friendship and sharing lessons in SpongeBob. Now I'm not saying it's educational media, but I am saying we make meaning from media based on our own needs. Earlier this week, I was a nominating juror for the International Children's Television Festival, pre Jeunesse, and I watched enough television to make the American Academy of Pediatrics faint. <laughs> Over 200 programs from around the world in five days. Let me describe three that I found wonderfully educational and ask, whether, and ask you whether you think they'd meet the study's definition, good for your child's learning or growth, or that teaches some type of lesson, such as an academic or social skill. Canadian kids designed and built playgrounds for their communities, and yes, the kids themselves used the tools, like the, the power tools themselves. Irish teens documented one day in their lives using uh, user-generated video. And a Brazilian telenovela dramatized the different challenges faced by twins, one white and one black. Now, by and large, we in the US don't make shows like this. When an American kid turns on the television, how often do they see any clue as to where they are or who they are? How often do they see news or documentaries made for them? By the way, no American company entered, sub submitted to the festival a nonfiction program for any age beyond preschool. So here's a conundrum. Most US educational kids TV is curriculum based, but in the German study that I mentioned, American kids barely mentioned learning facts from TV. German kids who get their own daily news show plus magazines and documentaries listed factual learning first as what they learned from television. When the US gets anxious about children's time spent with media and we get more anxious than any other country I've found around the world, we add education. Other countries look to draw their content closer to the audience. I think the Children's Television Act provides a cautionary tale about the intersection of policy and content. Broadcasters treated the three-hour educational programming mandate as a ceiling, not a floor. Kids got the minimum. When broadcasters called their shows FCC friendly, it was clear that regulators and not kids were their primary audience. Educational TV isn't necessarily quality TV. And while the government can demand shows with educational goals, it can't demand that the shows be any good. After a few innovative efforts at the start, broadcasters found they had no incentive to invest financially or creatively in their EI shows for older kids, and the ratings flatlined. Yes, educational media, on, educational content on free media is important, but it's condescending and wasteful to give only mediocre content to those with the fewest resources. Perhaps it's time to revisit the option of commercial broadcasters supporting public service media instead of airing unwatched programs. By contrast, when Australia sought to enhance children's TV, the government mandated home-produced content, but it also created production grants and tax credits. Producers competed for funds and commissions, and Australia now has a global reputation for high-quality, small-e educational media. There are a few important questions I want to address that this study didn't ask. One, do parents see and value learning from media beyond explicit curriculum, like 21st century skills like collaboration, communication, perspective taking, or lateral thinking. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Carla mentioned Williamsburg, is, that's a good example of that. Two, do parents see and value meta learning from, from media engagement, media literacy and critical thinking, logic, programming, or technology skills they gain? Three, does parental experience result in higher opinion of educational value? Minecraft scored poorly in this survey, but nearly half of the parents didn't feel they had enough experience with it to rate it. 
Video games got low marks for social skills learning. Do gamer parents better see games' potential for collaboration or communication? So how can we help parents see and extract the educational value in a wider range of media? Good tools exist, like Common Sense Media, like uh, Children's Technology Review. We need a wide range of resources, though, so parents can find the ones that match their values and their media matrix. While the study recommends engaging in an independent organization to code media for educational content, I'd be concerned about creating one box where what fits inside is educational and the rest is not. This doesn't consider the needs of the child or the whole child view of learning. It also can stifle innovation, I fear, and lead to re regression to the mean creatively as producers chase a stamp of approval by producing to the rubric. In closing, content creators also need to communicate better why their products are educational. I counsel them to talk about what they put in, their teaching philosophy, and how they mean for the product to be used, rather than promising or suggesting outcomes. To say what you are teaching is a statement of intent, and parents can decide whether that intent works for them or not. But learning is a complex process with a lot of external and contextual forces that media makers can't control. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. <laughs> It was very interesting. And it um, put me in the mind of a quote that I learned uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago from Joan Hanscoon, who said, all television is educational. The question is, what are they learning? And I think we can ask similar sorts of questions in response to David's presentation. Um, we could ask, who are they learning from? Why are they learning? With whom are they learning? How is this learning connected? And um, maybe most importantly, we can ask the question of, of how are they learning? Is their, is their approach to learning changing in fundamental ways because of their experiences with digital media? So thank you. I'd like to open up the um, conversation at this point to get a sense of what you think of what David had to say. And um, yes, so we'll grab a microphone. You'll introduce yourself. Hello. Yes, hi. It's Marge Kleinman from WNET. Um, David actually just struck upon and you when you quoted Joan again um, a few things that I've been hearing today about sort of the, the black and white thinking of fun and then there's educational. And I just think that it's important for us to keep in mind that it's not mutually exclusive. You know, we work really hard um, at Channel 13 and with PBS Kids on making our content all very engaging, character driven, narrative. And we really look at the curriculum as something that we can integrate in in very subtle and organic ways um, right into the story and the characters. So the kids feel it's relevant and they're pulled in and they're having fun. So it's not fun or learning. And I think we just all need to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I never lost my cafeteria voice, but. <laughs> 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 The, one of the things that you have said, it's not an either or, it's an and. And in most education, it's usually an and. I'd also like to say that as you're opening up, like you have a day home, and what are you going to do? You have an opportunity, when we're talking about parents and children, parents and a child, we're talking about other members of the family that are all learning together. And they are learning a lot because they're learning together. So let's, let's not lose that opportunity. Because sometimes the younger one is gonna to listen to the older one, and the older one is gonna say, oh, that was a good question. I didn't even think about that. So let's not think about either or, that it's only this or it's that. Look at the opportunities, and that will, and the more, the more often we get the parents involved, they are learning, and they are then building. Thank you. And I think that brings us back to um, the Yuri Brockenbrenner model that Michael introduced us to at the beginning of this morning's session. Um, the idea that children are growing and developing in numerous nested ecological settings, and at least in the setting of the family, we talk about parents and parents and parents, but we also know just how powerful siblings can be. I, I'm remembering a study that was done by uh, Rosemary Trulio, who's here, I think, somewhere. Um, a while ago that showed that um, 
that, that firstborn and only children were significantly more likely to be watching educational programming like Sesame Street than later born children who were watching more likely to be watching cartoons. So I think um, that's a very good point. Thank you. So I see another question here, huh? Hi, I'm Renee Shiro O'Leary, and I'm one of those people, I'm an educational consultant who helps producers add education. But one of, one of the things I think is very important that David said, it's, this is um, not a one-time thing. I agree with Marge that it's integrated, it has to be woven, but it's also cumulative. We don't have any sort of way, at least I, I haven't yet read the full report, but Things grow and build. They're thematic. They're based on curiosity. I mean, I don't think we should measure learning in such a unidimensional way, and yet we don't have many tools to measure the complex things that David's raised. So the kinds of 21st century schools, uh, skills rather, and schools where it should be, um, are, are not measured because they're complex. I mean, what does it mean? Yes, they may learn one thing or a new word or a new um, understanding of a particular thing, but where does it go, go from there? And this is what I see, uh, unfortunately, in a lot of media, unless it's a long-term series, where you can build over time and the characters develop um, where there are nuances. Otherwise, it's very, very heavy-handed, and I think we have to be very careful about that. So I think we need to greatly expand our understanding of what learning is and work from the very beginning of the development of the show um, to, to substantively build. It's scaffolding, as any educator knows what that means. So, thank you. I was just wondering if there's anybody who wants to offer a defense of curriculum-based educational media in the home and its importance. I'm Lisa. <laughs> Here we go. I'm Lisa Holt, and I'm with Classroom Inc. and we're a nonprofit. We actually create uh, learning games that are used as curriculum in the classroom. Uh, we work in the classroom, and we also provide professional development for teachers. And we work in the most underserved communities uh, in in uh, the U.S. So I love what you said about teachers and the theme of of not either or. Um, we try to work on uh, addressing coercive learning from the inside. And we try to do that by supporting teachers who we think are the unsung heroes. And we all know, uh, but we don't really know until we get in the classroom, how much is being thrown at them right now, whether it's Common Core and technology and new teacher evaluations, and dealing with struggling learners who are often four and five levels behind grade level in a classroom of 30 kids. So. We're excited because we actually can see how learning games, as Warren said, with instructional scaffolding, can be this enormous tool for teachers and how data and teacher dashboards can transform their learning. So the other thing is with online, we can now connect these ecosystems, right, in a way that we never could before. So the learning games that many people are creating out here and the learning games that we are creating for school are different because they serve different purposes but we are really excited about being able to connect teachers and parents and being able to connect our content together to create a uh, cycle. So that's my defense. I know there are also other uh, curriculum-based content creators out there. Uh, yes. Hi, uh, David Lowenstein, PBS Kids. And just to piggyback on what Marge said, um, we, you know, the public media, PBS Kids producers like Sesame and. Uh, uh, NET and others that do create you know character driven shows and um, and that is very important that we that the, the the characters kind of model a passion for a particular uh, curriculum and it's, so the curriculum doesn't necessarily necessarily lead it but by modeling that enthusiasm and, and becoming kind of that mouthpiece for, uh, uh, for the passion for a particular subject that that seems to be you know the way to go. I also wanted to to say it was very interesting to see the research. Um, from this from this uh, report about this drop off after age four um, in, in educational uh, media use, um, just about a week ago at our Ready to Learn advisory board, um, some of our advi advisors like Dorothy Strickland and, and Herb Ginsburg were talking about the, the the loss in learning gains after preschool when kids go into uh, low performing early elementary settings, 
Um, and so that, that it's, it's an interesting correlation between the, the drop off of, of, of media use. And that's why I think the, the work that, that Deb um, and others at CPB are leading with American Graduate, trying to encourage uh, people of all ages, siblings and uh, parents, and educators to be champions of education is so important. And the work I think also that Michael Roth is leading um, with his working group around digital badging uh, for early childhood educators um, and some of the work Digital Promise is doing about micro-credentialing and badging for parents and nannies and other informal care providers I think will be really critical so, so that we can um, we can combat the drop the drop in, you know, uh, the drop off in, in use of, of educational media and also combat hopefully the loss in, in learning gains that, that kids experience when they get exposed to high quality preschool content. Very, very interesting comments and, I, and one comment in particular that you, you make is the notion of creating digital badges for nannies and other early childhood educators who may not be in the sort of formal settings that we typically track. <laughs> Um, I saw Michael running over here. There's one right over here also. Ah, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Chris Sir from Serious Thinking. Uh, we're working on a project that's really relevant to this discussion, and it's something that I don't think enough people have thought about with all the stuff we've been creating all these years at Sesame Workshop and Between the Lines and elsewhere, is that if you have a school home connection, you can actually re-edit material that was created for broadcasting and put it together so it's very relevant to today's work in school. So a uh, successful all Sesame Workshop, our company, are working together to try this out so that successful uh, preschools and kindergarten classes now have what they call home links, where they're taking Sesame content, content that we produce to fill in gaps. We have an animated dictionary where we can take the words that are actually being taught in school that week, and the kids go home and watch this the way they would watch Sesame Street, and they're told which ones to watch each day, and the kids love it. The early results are that they, they look forward to this as they would to one of their favorite shows, but when they watch with the parents, the parents are actually seeing what the kids are learning in school that week. So I think this is a really promising area. It's still in its infancy, but we hope we can see a lot more of it. I think, Christopher, that's a really important point. That by, just by its um, nature and by its design, this particular survey carved up media as television and digital media, e-books and regular books. But part of what we know and, and part of the conversations that I've had extensively with Linda Zemensky is the notion that um, we're creating these uh, opportunities for transmedia properties and also multimedia properties and it may not be as relevant anymore to say this versus that because they're, they're coming together in ways that we couldn't have predicted even five years ago. Okay, so I'm getting the, um, I'm getting the indicator that we have one more minute over here. So I'm gonna take one last question. And again, we'll, we'll get back to issues or comments or questions that, yes, yes, I'm sorry. You don't even know what I'm gonna say. It better be good. Hi, can I sit down? and I'm here with National Geographic Kids, and I just wanted to piggyback on what a lot of people were saying, especially my lunchroom lady friends, about the word and, educational and fun, because I think that if we don't embrace both, we're all gonna go down in flames. National Geographic Kids magazine, 10 years ago, was about to go under, and we reinvented the magazine using a panel of kids to make the magazine, we, we, we we stayed nonfiction, but we did everything through the lens of fun. Through, we went into classrooms and had them teach us how to teach them through the lens of fun. And the circulation dramatically rose and rose and rose, and we're up to 1.1 million subscribers. And the reason is because we hit on a formula that they like, and it's photos, facts, fun, and all things animals. And we have this department called We Are the Cure. It's going to sound so simple, but they're just facts. A cockroach can live without its head for 14 days. Like, kids, <laughs> than grants of saying on the planet Earth. Wow. Pretty good. And, but, you know, but the problem is some of the parents don't know how to explain this, so I get, I get criticism from my friends who are like, you know, my son's saying the universe is flat, and please explain it. And I'm like, well, I don't know, you know. <laughs> but the idea is that it's fostering um, a conversation between kids 
kids and parents and educators and parents, but it's got to be fun. So I guess my main point is that it's all based on the content, and the content has to have that dual purpose of feeling educational to the parent, but absolutely it has to be fun for the kid. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. from this conversation this morning. We know that cockroaches will live for 14 days. <laughs> and that's not uh, insubstantial. And <laughs> David would applaud that. So we're going to move now to a conversation. Wait, wait, wait. I'm leaning in. I'm leaning in. <laughs> I just think we cannot discuss the future of educational media without acknowledging that we're not living in a one-to-many environment anymore. This is many-to-many. And we're not the media makers. This is the media maker. Our kids are the media makers. I have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old, and in very short time, they are going to consider that they should be making all the media that they're seeing. So we really have to take that into account. I'd love to hear more discussion of that here, and I think that's my personal provocation to the room, even though it doesn't ask Yeah, I think that will be a part of the conversation in the next session as well. So thank you. Um, we're moving now to a conversation that um, brings our focus to parents. And we saw from the report, the data that Vicki um, presented to us this morning, that parents seem to want to get more information about the educational content that's out there, but it's not always clear that they are turning to the best sources um, to get that information. So we're really lucky to have today Sita Pai, who it works in research at an organization called Common Sense Media. And that organization has been working hard to review and then provide insight into and explanations of the age appropriateness of titles across a variety of platforms. So Sita, I think, can give us some insight into the challenges and the opportunities that are facing us in, in getting what we're learning here today to uh, a constituency that really wants and needs to hear it. Thank you all for this, Michael and, um, and Vicky for this opportunity to be here. Obviously, I'm not Linda Bush, who's <laughs> on your um, agenda. Linda was unwell. She was actually in the city, but unwell and couldn't make it. So I'm thrilled to be here in her stead and see so many colleagues from uh, past and present lives. Um, thrilled to be here. Um, so Common Sense Media, thank you for that great introduction, um, Amy. There are a couple of points of intersection. Uh, with what we do and um, the study, and I'd like to just raise them. First off, of course, we rate and review children's media. We have for about 10 years now for um, age appropriateness, and we rated over um, 20,000 titles from books all the way to video games. Um, and more recently, thanks to the generous support of the SCE Fund, we've been rating and reviewing um, interactive digital media, so mobile apps, video games, websites uh, for learning potential as well. Um, I have about 2,000 titles rated and reviewed. And um, we also very recently launched a new platform for educators to discover, use, and share um, digital media for learning called Graphite um, that uh, draws on the same rubric that we use that we developed in consultation with several of you in the room. Um, to assess the learning potential of media. And a few things to say about that. For one, we talk about the potential of media for learning rather than outcomes. Um, and, and we're not alone in this. Warren, of course, um, does something very similar as do, as do others. But we focus on engagement as being the first dimension in learning. Um, and then we look at a lot of different pedagogical features of a particular media product, and finally, um, we look at the supports that um, a product offers. How can the learning go off screen? What can um, others in the child's learning ecology, whether it's siblings, other peers, um, parents, other family members, caregivers, teachers, etc., what, what supports are there for um, the learning ecology of the child? So these are the several things that we look at. And in addition to our editorial reviews, which are produced by uh, many of whom are educators themselves or um, you know, experts in the field of digital media and learning. We also have parent reviews and kid reviews. Actually, kids um, provide about over 60% of our user reviews come from kids. 
Um, so we try to triangulate that information. Um, and of course, now we have teacher reviews on graphite, and um, I'll speak in a little bit about how we're looking to bridge those, um, those different platforms. Um, the other point of intersection, as many of you may know, is that we have a program for the study of children in media. We actually have a research program, uh, thanks to the wonderful Vicky Rideout, who uh, we've conducted uh, four um, nationally representative surveys of media use and um, attitudes. Uh, we recently released in October the second round of our zero to eight study, which looked at um, media use in kids in this country from ages zero to eight. And one of the things we found was that while there was still a digital um, divide of, of sorts, a gap, um, it's closing to some extent. And the ubiquity and the, and the um, expansion of digital and mobile use among young kids. So in terms of points of intersection um, with the study. But of course, TV time still dominates. Um, so Almost every page of the report had interesting findings that I would love to comment on, literally almost every page. And um, I'm trying to focus in and rein myself in to focus on a few that I think um, had real takeaways for us at Common Sense Media and those of us who provide information directly to parents. Um, first off, I'm not the first to say this. Many of you in the room have already said this. Vicky herself brought this up. Um, we absolutely need to triangulate um, <coughs> parents' perceptions of what is educational. And, you know, obviously we need observations, tracking, etc. observations of what kids are actually exposed to, um, evaluations of what they're actually exposed to. Um, and it's really not clear, I think, um, what um, parents are considering educational. Of course, we saw 58% think that Sesame Street is educational, but only 4% thought Minecraft is. Now, we gave Minecraft our highest rating for learning potential at Common Sense Media, and the teachers on Graphite do as well. So, and, and David spoke um, eloquently about you know, what we could potentially consider um, to have learning value. So I think there's a lot that we need to do to translate learn, the learning sciences or research on learning and development of children to parents in a more um, uh, in a more approachable way, in a more relatable way. Um, in our reviews, we not only provide a rating, but we provide a lot of information in the review about what parents can do to help and uh, translate and uh, unpack what 21st century skills are and so forth. But I think we, you know, there's a lot more that we can do um, to reach parents. Um, you know, also parents just being more familiar with television as a medium and the sheer volume of content that's available on the newer platforms on mobile um, is a factor that I think we should consider. Um, second, wearing my statistician hat, I want to say that the interaction effects, and I'll explain myself, the interaction effects here in the study nullify, in June, I think you know what I'm talking about, and Jennifer, um, nullify the main effects which is that the demographic differences that you're seeing are really what we should be talking about. Rather than saying all parents, you know, once you start getting into the demographic differences, then you cannot really be talking about parents as a whole. And for us at Common Sense Media, what that means is we should be redoubling our efforts to reach a wider and um, more and a larger population of parents. But seeing especially as they seem to want this information, whether it's Latina families, um, and also look to um, media as a source for learning for their kids. Um, it's really time for us to do that. Um, several of our, a lot of our content, especially our parent advice content, um, is um, sent in through schools in Spanish, and um, you know we're looking to expand that, and, and that's, that's not enough, I'm just looking at the fact that we need to redouble our efforts in that. And finally, I actually found it encouraging that parents, this is a tiny little paragraph in the, in the report, but I actually found it encouraging that parents look to teachers as a source of information for, um, for what counts as educational. Um, as, as I just told you about Graphite, where teachers are weighing in on what they consider to be educational, and it might be surprising to some of you, I encourage you to visit and check it out. Um, we are looking for ways to bridge that homeschool connection, like many of you are, but to actually bring those platforms together so that you know kids are talking to parents and teachers, and teachers are talking to parents, and parents are talking to teachers, and so forth. 
And um, with that, I will um, leave it. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Sita. I think uh, one very important takeaway from what you're saying is that in this room, many of us, many of us are very good at um, recognizing that children are not monolithic, but we're not as good at doing the same for parents. So I think we should really be encouraged to understand the variety of ways that parents approach children's media. Um, so as we open, open up for discussion, um, one pointed question that I've, I wanted to ask Ellen Galinsky is the question of, um, through your work in, um, in the mind and the making on the science of children's brain development, is there a role? of um, new media, digital media, or even traditional media, like television, in the healthy development of, of young children? Uh, <clears throat> I think that the discussion that's been raised by Dave and, and uh, he sent me electronically what you said to us, it, it, I, I really want to read it now. Uh, the discussion that uh, is raised, the, that we're talking around, is what is learning? Um, and is learning something that you are fed and you get an opportunity to respond to or is or how much of learning is really um, child created what engagement really means which is that you take it and you make it your own which is the kind of programs that I think you were describing that you saw in other countries um, and I think that parents and teachers and kids are all struggling as we move into the 21st century about um, how we best learn. What, what we know from the research, and I've now spent 14 years filming some of the best research on uh, cognitive development, um, neuroscience, as well as the developmental studies, is the importance of the child being active in his or her own learning, and that the adult building on and extending what the child does. I even think that people like Catherine Snow, who talks about books as learning, uh, will talk about that it's a platform for a conversation, it's a platform for a give and take. So what I'm taking from this conversation at this point is that we really need to help all of the adults in children's lives understand how we best learn, which is what we're trying very much to do uh, with Mind in the Making and what we're trying very much to do with the Bezos Family Foundation. I'm, I know they're the funder of this and I'm here representing them as well. We're trying to bring that science directly for families with real clues uh, that they can then incorporate using our own definition of learning to figure out how to build on and extend what children do. And I think that's, uh, you know, I just wrote the Bezos Family Foundation. I said, this is getting feisty and I haven't had so much fun at an event for a long time um, because I think we're getting at the real core issues. Um, and in some ways it isn't an either or, but in some ways it is an either or. And I think we've got to look at those differences. Thank you. Thank you. So because I was ignoring the folks to my right in the last discussion, I'm going to move over here first. Can I see you? Yes. I just wanted to, I'm June Lee from Sesame Workshop. I wanted to just piggyback on what both um, Sita and Michael were saying um, about, you know, doing a deeper dive into these data and also really looking very strongly at demographic differences. Um, we are doing more analyses, especially in the Hispanic subsample in, in these data, and I'm sure there'll be more discussion in the next panel. Um, and we're really, um, you know, looking at understanding them on their own terms and not, you know, um, comparing them to the majority or the dominant culture and really surfacing um, demographic differences um, that are driving media use by, you know, the usual suspects of socioeconomic um, factors, but also um, things that are really um, germane to this to this community, like um, citizenship status and you know language at home, um, and we're also drawing from uh, Brandenburger's model, um, which Michael mentioned, um, to talk about how different contexts might be driving um, in things that we think are important um, in children's media use, like joint media engagement and educational media use. So we're looking at child level factors, home level factors, and broader socio demographic factors, and see how they kind of interact with one another. So, um, so we are thinking about it, and um, when they are ready, uh, we will be really excited to share those, re those results. Thank you, Jim. And next to you, Lewis. Hi, I'm Lewis Bernstein from Sesame Workshop. And David, you provoked me. I, I would be sitting here silently, but you provoked me. And, and I'll tell you why. 
Um, yes, learning could be anything and everywhere. It could be the and that Charlotte talked about. But we're in a nation in which we have haves and have nots. We have 50% of parents who are raising children all by themselves. Um, and there's a divide. And if you think about the divide 10 years from now, that divide will continue to widen unless we think a little bit about some of the deep needs and deep education that children need. And those are both cognitive skills, their social and emotional skills. In the 21st century, they need to be able to differentiate facts and not only memorize facts. They need to be able to uh, think. They need to be able to collaborate and communicate. And so if you don't find a way to make education deeply fun and engaging, then we're at a loss. So it's, it can't be everything. You have to you have to really find a focus. And many of us here have to recognize that that our nation has a real challenge in front of us. And one of the tools are these amazing media that we're looking at. And there's an explosion in those media. And I don't know the woman's name who said it's not just one too many anymore. That's we're watching those statistics go down in television. We're watching statistics go up in other ways. And maybe there's only five minutes of mobile, but the opportunity to create sub-communities and for communities to engage in learning is something that we're in and we have to continue to make it fun. And, and we, can't just, we can't just demonize schools. They are what they are. They, are, they capture us and we're captive audiences in school. But we have to cap captivate children in ways that are incredibly engaging in order to really teach them deep learning. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Yes. Um, can we get a microphone here? I'm Jenny Radeski. I'm a pediatrician. I'm tra training in developmental behavioral pediatrics at Boston Medical Center, um, which serves mostly a low-income community. Um, my research actually involves how parent use of mobile devices, um, specifically during meal times, affects their interactions with their kids. And I, um, I am really interested as a developmental pediatrician on how face-to-face -face interactions improve the sorts of things that are so important to child success, like their self-regulation abilities, their emotional health, their ability to calm really strong reactions to things. Um, and I'd like to use media not as a barrier to those sorts of interactions, but how can we engage parents and children together? Maybe the curriculum isn't as relevant as the parent just understanding what the child's experiences or what the child's, what's going on in the child's mind, and the same with the, with the child understanding the parent. And so in my clinic, which is um, you know, mostly the apps that parents are using are very, very simple, repetitive apps that their kids are using. So those are the ones that they have available to them for free. I, I would love to see more um, mobile-based uh, media that involves not just the, the content of social skills, like the sharing and perspective taking, but the process of, a, of social regulation. Like I use, I often recommend like a visual timer, which is free to download and that they, to help them with waiting and to help them with, um, you know, uh, being patient and not having such impulsivity. I've encouraged use of like the calm counter, which is like to help kids count down backwards. I, I don't know if there's a um, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood app, but I sing those songs with my four-year-old all the time to help him calm down. So things like that to engage parent and child together about the process of these sort of emotional skills. Um, I just think I've been so excited about what people have been saying because it really taps into these like things Thank you, Jenny. I think that's a really good point. And it also brings to mind um, the fact that we haven't really talked about social media in, as, a, as opportunities to develop social skills and social connections, um, whether they're apps or things like Facebook or just text messaging with parents and children with one another. Um, so, because I took two questions from there. <laughs> I'll have one here and then one there. Okay, yes. Hi, I'm Susan Friedman. I'm from the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And um, I am just interested in people know about the technology and young children position statement. Um, which NAYC did with the Fred Rogers Center and um, really provide some guidelines for teachers and for parents about how to choose media. And I think that this, it's something that I've been working on is coming up with some good examples of um, media use in classrooms. And um, I can see the value of also um, providing um, good 
examples of media use in homes. And I think one of the things that, that has been interesting to me is this idea that um, parents may not understand what learning looks like. So if you think about in the real world, a child playing with mud and sticks to one parent might look really like a lot of learning and to another parent might say, what are you doing? And I think that's sort of what's going on um, also with media is people don't really understand, parents may not understand what their children are learning. So I have a son who's obsessed with Minecraft and you could say, okay, well it's a beautiful day and he's inside all day and what's he doing? And um, or you could say he's making things and he's doing um, you know, a lot of really creative work and he's set up a server and there's a whole social network of kids using the system and they're coding. And then among that group of children are some children who are using and not making and then there are children who are making. And so I, one thing that's come to me as I'm looking at good examples is helping parents to recognize media and apps where children are making things and creating. And I think that that you know, that's a key, I think, is helping parents understand the value in the making and not just the using. Thank you. And we have time for one last question. Yeah, yeah I'll try to be quick. Uh, I think some of the comments are there. Just Your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a problem. I'm Craig Hadcock. I will give plausible deniability to Mel, to my to Lewis. I am a trustee of the SESB workshop. Um, um, I guess for this crowd, I also am a children's author of a book called Owen and the Zay, which some of you may have heard of, The Hippo and the Tortoise. Uh, but I just want to say something that really picks up on, is it Melina? That's the most interesting thing that I've heard in a really long time, that when you cut off the head of a cockroach, <laughs> I can spend the next three weeks of my life riffing off what happens when you cut off the head of a cockroach? From a guillotine to a debate and a discussion about capital punishment, going back to Lewis's comment. And the, I'm going to just say, labels tend to get in the way. We're using fun and learning as two different things. And I think if we, the following, what about affect? All I want to hear a kid say is, wow, isn't that cool? And I think anything that we do through that lens will touch kids at the core. And so I just want to caution from my own personal experience something called the 80-20 rule, which is used in a lot of with the Pareto principle. My guess, I'm going to just put it out as a challenge and then I'll sit down. We need to create a sense of awe, wonder, and enchantment. It's a little different than fun. But I'm going to pose that my guess is we can get 80% of the educational needs from the 20% of the inputs the efforts and the resources. I don't know which 20% it is. It's like advertising 50% is a total waste. We just don't know which half. But I think this notion of all wonder and enchantment is, I'm going to come back. i got to go to National Geographic. Right now. But I think that is the special sauce that I've heard here today. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to say thank you everyone who's participated in this conversation. Um, I'll put my research hat on for a moment and say that, um, just to kind of echo what Renee pointed out, we are not very good yet at measuring those sorts of things that are more intangible. And that's often what leads us back to, you know, is it age appropriate? Is it appropriately engaging? It's clear to me now that we need to be um, looking at these new media technologies through the eyes of children and helping parents see the, their children's experiences in new ways. So thank you to you all for a very exciting and enriching conversation. None of it's come together yet. We're collecting all sorts of interesting input. Let's take a break. Don't blow it for us. We're just about out of time. Yeah. 15 minutes for the break. And then come back. We've got some special guests who will be joining us later on after the break. Um, we're off to the Scrum Start. Thank you all. <laughs>